Hi, everyone. We had some technical difficulties this morning with our live stream for Sunday worship. I'm really sorry about that. And I thought since the scripture lesson and the sermon weren't part of what was captured, I would go ahead and read for you now our scripture lesson from this morning and then give my message. I'm here in the empty church and uh, it's kind of a magical place in the evening. So here now this word from Genesis chapter 25 verses 19 through 34. These are the descendants of Isaac. Abraham's son, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padam Aram, sister of Laban, the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. And the Lord granted his prayer and his wife Rebekah conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is to be this way, why do I live? So she went to inquire of the Lord, and the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. One shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. When her time to give birth was at hand, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy mantle, so they named him Esau. Afterwards, his brother came out, and his hand was gripping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. When the boys grew up, Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, while Jacob was a quiet man living in tents. Isaac loved Esau because he was fond of game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. Esau said to Jacob, let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. Esau said, I am about to die. Of what use is a birthright to me? Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. This is the end of the reading. We are spending a week, this week and many weeks, this summer, focusing on one book of the Bible, the very first book. It's a part of the Bible we might know familiar stories from, like Adam and Eve, and creation, and the flood. There are also stories in the book of Genesis that deal with our ancestors like Abraham. It's the back half of Genesis, a section sometimes called the patriarchs. These stories chronicle how one generation, beginning with Abraham, led to another generation, including Isaac, and another generation, including Jacob, and so on and so forth, and soon the foundation of God's people in Israel had been formed. And yet, these foundational stories aren't exactly a Norman Rockwell painting of perfect family life. Genesis is a chronicle of real people and their real lives. Perhaps I should have named our series this summer the real patriarchs of Canaan country. Because like the reality shows that we watch for entertainment, 
and scandal and guilty pleasure. Some of the stories of the Bible read almost like a TV show drama rather than some shining moral guide. Here are some other names I thought of for labeling the summer series. Summer soap operas from the book of Genesis. Dysfunctional family albums from the book of Genesis. Take a summer dive into the family feuds. Abraham and Sons, the reason why family therapy was invented. And last, the flawed family of God from Abraham to us. Ouch. I was talked out of most of these names as being too much of a downer for the summer. The Bible, though, is an interesting book. It's not all rainbows and sunshine, kind of like our summer so far. Turbulent weather is just part of the season, just like turbulent stories are part of the Bible. So I say we embrace them and get the most out of them that we can. Last week, if you were listening along, you heard us tell the story of Abraham, how he was taking his family line into his own hands, and when birthing a child was not happening with Sarah, he took an enslaved woman from his household. She became pregnant, and Ishmael was born. Well, soon after Ishmael was born, Sarah became pregnant. And soon Ishmael was unwanted and unneeded, and Ishmael and his mother Hagar were sent out into the wilderness by God. And Abraham uh, was the instigator of that. God challenged Abraham's decision to send part of his family away. And that challenge included this terrible, famous act of Abraham believing he needed to sacrifice Isaac, that that was God's challenge to him, was to take his own line and put it into question. This week, after that harrowing tale, we find Isaac is now fully grown. He's married to Rebecca and they have experienced 20 years of barrenness only to find out that the twins that she is bearing are arguing before they're even born. What can the parents do? Choose sides, obviously. I'm tempted sometimes when I read these stories to put some popcorn on and watch this stuff from my couch like a movie unfolding. Isn't this what the best entertainment is? A fun distraction from our own real lives? Here's the problem though. This isn't entertainment. It's real life. And not only is it the foundational story of our faith ancestors, it's also a true story. And the apple, all of us, doesn't fall that far from our ancestral tree. We might like to think our families are not this complicated and drama-filled, but really, who are we kidding? So just a little recap. We heard about Isaac growing up, how he married Rebecca. They couldn't conceive for 20 years, and then they finally do. And that's great, right? Not so great. Rebecca, her pregnancy is so painful. She can tell that something difficult is growing in her, and she prays to God for understanding, and this is what she hears God saying. Surprise, you're having twins. But not only that, these two children will form entirely different nations. They will be divided from the start. The elder shall serve the younger. 
Now here's something you need to know. That statement, that last statement by God to Rebecca, the elder shall serve the younger, was scandalous. In no normal household at this time did an elder son serve a younger son. There were rules in the world for a reason, to keep the order, to maintain the peace. Hierarchy kept everyone in line, and there was never any question about who would inherit what. The elder son got the birthright. They were the be-all, end-all, no questions asked. But here was God, inconveniently lifting the last to be first, and the first to be last. God is in this story here to challenge the hierarchy. So from the very beginning of these twins' lives, the stage is set for family conflict. Esau first is born a big baby full of hair, pink, healthy skin, and Jacob is second, smaller, leaner, more petite. Scripture says he came out of the womb by clinging on to the heel of his brother. These boys grew into very different men. Esau loved hunting and being outside. He lived in the present, and he was rarely home except to take care of his basic needs. Jacob, on the other hand, loved being at home. He thrived there. He learned to cook and tend to the domestic needs of the family. As parents, we're taught from the very beginning in all of the books, never pick favorites among your children. Well, Rebecca and Isaac, they fell hard, each for the child who was most like them. They either didn't have parenting books and the 1800s BC, or Rebecca and Isaac just didn't read them. Actually, we can all relate. There's the way that we've pictured it, and then there's the way it ends up being. You can probably imagine what the household dynamics were like. Jacob watches the way his father loves his brother better how it's just assumed by everyone that his brother will be inheriting everything in the household, everything that has become so important and meaningful to Jacob. We can imagine Jacob getting support from his mom, but what can she really do? Both of them, the younger son and the mother, are at the bottom of the hierarchy in this household. The options for surviving and fulfilling God's bold reversal are actually pretty limited. Jacob, though, was a clever man. Knowing his brother's tendency to only come home when he was hungry or needed sleep, and knowing his own strength was in cooking good food, Jacob saw an opportunity. He made some lentil stew, and suppose it was delicious smelling lentil stew, kind of hard to imagine, he made it, and his brother came home hungry. And he used this food, this bowl of lentils, this pottage, and his brother's hunger as a lure. I'll give you this food if you'll sell me your birthright. I'll let you eat, but only if you agree to this reversal of our roles. Now, maybe Esau was just really hungry. I don't know. Maybe some part of him knew that the future was less important to him than the present. I don't know. Maybe he just didn't care about the family heritage the same way Jacob did. I don't know. Whatever the reason, Esau gave it all up. He sold his birthright for a mess of pottage. Jacob succeeded in turning the tables on the hierarchy in a way God had ordained, but with methods that leave us saying, that was a little sketchy. 
When we see a family where favoritism, deceit, cunning, outwitting, and disloyalty are rampant, we think, is God really there? There's the way we want it to be, and then there's the way it ends up being. I must have read this story five times this week, wishing it worked out differently. Where is the value in uplifting a story where deceit highlights disloyalty and the foundation of Israel is built on a sketchy exchange over pottage? What is God doing? Where can God's fingerprints be found? And yet, this is the story that has made it into the Bible. Like it or not, this is the story that lays the foundation for Israel. Like it or not, this is our story. And so it leaves me to wonder, and maybe you too, is our human struggle with conflict and relationships not also part of God's creation? Is our human struggle with conflict and relationships not also part of God's creation? What if the family is the place where these existential conflicts can be played out? Jacob probably made a poor decision to use his brother's hunger as an opportunity to test his loyalty and scoop up his inheritance. But Esau also made a failure of judgment when he let his own future and his family's value go in exchange for satisfying an immediate need. Mistakes were made. And yet... Because they happen to be a family, a group of people who, despite all the misjudgment and shortcomings, share a covenant with each other and with God. A family who inherited the same intangible, mysterious promise from God. A family in whose veins pump the same blood. Because these humans get to work out their humanness within their family, there is something more to this story than we can yet see. The arc of this family narrative is broad, and this divided family has time on their side. Our stories over the next few weeks here at church will follow Jacob. He inherits the birthright, and he is later renamed Israel. It's his children that form the 12 tribes of Israel. Yet everywhere Jacob goes in his life, conflict follows him. Yet it's because of this conflict that he grows and develops. God finds a way to work through his imperfection to build a legacy that supports generations of God's people through some of the best times and some of the worst. God's grace finds the lowly, the lost, the least, and the most messed up. And God works through them to bring hope and transformation. Sound familiar? This is our story. As for the brothers, Esau and Jacob, conflicted from birth, more different than you could ever imagine, one dishonored by his disloyalty to the family, the other dishonored by his cunning deceit. For them, things get worse before they get better. You've probably heard the story of Jacob putting on fur on his arms so that he could deceive his blind, near-death father Isaac into blessing him instead of Esau. 
And for this, Esau vows to kill Jacob, and Jacob flees. They spend decades apart. They each change and evolve as time and God would have them do. And at long last, they meet again when Jacob wants to come back home. Jacob, afraid that Esau still wants to harm him, sends a peace offering and brings every strong person he can find. He brings his family, his wives, he brings everything. And when Jacob sees Esau coming from the distance, his fears grow. He has 400 men with him. And he told his wives and children, prepare, get ready, stay back. And Jacob comes alone out to the field and bows down seven times to Esau as Esau's coming. But this is what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 33, verse 4. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. Jacob then tried to give his brother a portion of what he had, a portion of what he had taken in the first place. And Esau told him, I already have enough. Keep it. In return, Jacob tells Esau, I see the face of God in you. What is the miracle in this story? Is it that God reversed the family hierarchy of the day and brought the last to be first so that a great nation could be built from humble origins? Maybe. But what if the miracle is also that even though families are complicated and gritty and messy and broken, God never leaves. Hope never fades. There is possibility that we ourselves cannot imagine. What if the real miracle here is that Esau himself understood in the end that he had enough and that he didn't need to be first and the most powerful and vindictive? Maybe the real miracle is that he recognized God's blessing on Jacob's life as the younger, lesser brother and he was ultimately okay with that. Maybe the real miracle here is that after everything they'd been through, the brothers reconciled and saw God in each other. This is so much more than a soap opera or a reality TV show. This is our heritage. This is our story, this is our challenge, and this is our possibility. Life is messy. It rarely goes how we planned. Family will disappoint us, will disappoint family. But God never gives up. God will te keep teaching us the surprising ways of love, over and over and over again until we are finally able to learn it ourselves. And sometimes that takes a long, messy life. Don't lose faith. Don't stop trying. Will you pray with me? Oh God, thank you for this quiet space as we hear your word, as we let it soak into us and understand it in fresh ways for this time and this place. Bless our lives, 
our families, our conflicts, our relationships that seem too far gone. And may the great arc of your love be constantly above us, pulling us back to the understanding that you are with us and that you are in the face of each person we meet. In the name of Jesus Christ, who reconciles us and redeems us. Amen. Thank you for watching.